Welcome to week five. We're now halfway through our practicum, and we're also halfway through the course. So I'd like to just pause here to say a few words about where we've been and where we're headed. During the first week, I introduced Dietrich Bonhoeffer's vision of the spiritual life as he presents it in Life Together. Hopefully you've continued to make your way through the book. And if you haven't made it all the way through the book, that's just fine for now. But you're going to want to wrap that up by the end of next week, by the end of week six. That'll give you a chance to process it a bit uh, before you tackle that final learning activity. In weeks two and three, you'll remember, we explored two key concepts for thinking about spirituality and discipleship today. Practices and stories. Practices, we said, are those shared activities that address fundamental human needs and that when woven together form a way of life. We explored how practices play out in culture, in church, and in ritual. To explore the role of stories, we watched Sarah Polly's documentary, The Stories We Tell. And we practiced the craft of storytelling ourselves by writing our spiritual autobiographies. Also in week three, we chose a practice and committed to four weeks of action and reflection together. Last week, we began uh, our consideration of everyday life by exploring the home. And this week, we're exploring work. Now, to do this, I'd like to offer up three brief reflections. In your readings this week, both Sharon and Ammerman consider work within our contemporary world, and that's really important. But the reflections I'd like to offer here offer a broader set of perspectives on work and labor. They'll offer some historical and theological background, but they will also offer some further questions for reflecting on the role of work today in our spiritual lives. To get us started, I'd like to invite us to consider a biblical text, and where else better to begin than at the beginning? As you may know, Genesis 1 and 2 offer actually two different creation accounts. And so before uh, we get started and, and before we consider these texts, I want to invite you to just pause here and to revisit those two texts to uh, re-familiarize yourself with them. When he reflects on these passages, Fretheim makes some very helpful observations. Most basically for Fretheim, it is the importance of God's evaluation of creation as good. Good and not perfect, says Fretheim. Perhaps one of his most helpful observations to this point is that the word subdue in Genesis 1.28. He talks about this in a way that suggests that this word means to bring order out of our continuing disorder. He points out that in Genesis 1, the word is used pre-sin, meaning that humans are apparently commanded to subdue before sin has brought about its negative consequences. This is suggestive, Fretheim argues, because creation is not complete. It is in process. And God has chosen humanity to partner with God in this ongoing process of co-creation. In his own words, he says, From God's perspective, the world needs work, development, and change. They are what God intends for it. And God enlists human beings and other creatures to that end. Or from another angle, God did not exhaust divine creativity in the first week of the world. God continues to create and uses creation in a vocation that involves the becoming of creation. And by this reading, our work and our labor, they are not primarily seen as, as the consequences of sin, as Luther is going to view it, though our work does change in light of the developments of Genesis 3. But instead, as Fretheim argues, we, we are made for work. We are made to be agents of God's creative work. 
And when God creates, evaluates, and claims that creation is good, God implies that we have a role to play. At its most basic level, when we talk about work theologically, one of the things that we want to, to think about, to claim, is that uh, we have, first and foremost, the vocation of creation. And Fretheim helps us to see that in some particular ways in his reading of the Genesis creation text. Now, as I've mentioned a few times already, at the time of the Reformation, Luther offered up a stunning critique of medieval theology. Luther came to see the elitism of the clergy and of monasticism as a real challenge to faith. Perhaps his most lasting breakthrough in this regard came with his revision of medieval theology's understanding of vocation. In the 16th century, only priests and those in religious orders had vocations. Vocations here understood as callings to be a part of God's work in the world. It was through these clerical vocations that others met God. Priests vicariously represented Jesus at the table, and monasticism was the ideal form of righteousness. It was essentially true Christianity. But Luther challenged this with his idea that all were called through baptism. And this is what Luther meant by claiming a priesthood of all believers. And as Karl Marx put it, Luther, quote, turned priests into laymen because he turned laymen into priests. He took the clergy off their high horses, and at the same time he lifted up the laity into the domain of the sacred, that place previously reserved only for a few. When it came to translating the Latin word for vocation, vocatio, into German, Luther settled in on the word beruf, or occupations. To get a sense of why Luther made this choice, let's take a look at some of his own writing. If you are a craftsman, you will find the Bible placed in your workshop, in your hands, in your heart. Only look at your tools, your needle, your thimble, your beer barrel, and you will find this saying, the Bible written on them. You have as many preachers as there are transactions, commodities, tools, and other implements in your house and estate. And they shout this to your face. My dear, use me toward your neighbor as you would want him to act toward you with that which is his. See, for Luther, there were essentially two kinds of callings. There is, in the first instance, a general calling. That is a call to be in relationship with God. This general call is the call to be in relationship with a God who invites us to join in the ongoing work of creation. But there is also a special call, or in other words, the call that is particular to the individual. This is the personal call, the call that takes into consideration you and your situation, your gifts, and who you are, it is in this sense of a call that we must always be oriented towards the love of our neighbor. For Luther, a call or a vocation is less a call to a specific kind of work, or even quality of work for that matter, and it's more of a specific invitation to orient oneself when one's work, whatever it may be, toward the end of serving one's neighbor. There is, in a sense, a way in which one's vocation can be separated from the immediate work or task at hand, but only in the sense that any work can be situated within this ultimate concern for one's neighbor. Luther's understanding of work and labor is that it is always interrelational. In fact, how does one discern a call? Not simply by 
investing in the inward journey of the spiritual life, not by uh, thinking about or getting in tune with one's desires, it has very little to do with personal choice. That may be there, but to discern a call, it is of little importance in Luther's concept of vocation. The call is always mediated by others, by one's neighbors. And this is what Lutherans mean by an external call. And the internal sense of call is always secondary. Like Luther, Calvin saw vocation as a way of understanding human action, human work in relationship to God's work. However, whereas Luther had a very personal God, a God that is present at the table for you, you may remember. Calvin had a more transcendent, more detached idea of God. That is, God was wholly other. God's action and God's understanding, sometimes we call God's understanding revelation, can never be confused with human action and human understanding. For Calvin, there were just two movements, faith and action. Faith meant trusting God's sovereignty, and action meant obedience. Now that may sound a bit harsh, but remember that it was actually Luther that thought about work as a burden. What kind of burden? Think back to Genesis 3, to the consequences of sin. It is within this framework that Luther understood social structures, those structural realities that resulted in a very clear social hierarchy in medieval society. Social mobility wasn't really possible in your work, therefore your social class, were things, one were, were, were things that one was born into and in which one stayed. That's how Luther saw it. Luther saw this rather rigid social hierarchy as a result of sin, the consequence of sin. But for Calvin, on the other hand, work was a gift, a thing to be enjoyed. And that joy found in work was a sign that God's will could be made a reality here on earth, something Luther, of course, rejected. For Calvin, work alone became the primary experience of faith in a God who demanded hard work as a sign of one's faith and obedience. Perhaps you know this, but Max Weber, in his famous work, The Protestant Ethic in the Spirit of Capitalism, links Calvin's understanding of work, work understood as ordained by God, as intrinsically good, a sign of faith and obedience as the, quote, ethic of modern capitalism. It is this Protestant work ethic which encouraged hard work and expected something in return. It's this kind of notion of work um, that will lead into modern-day capitalism, right? And it didn't take long, of course, before this concept of work led to the final concept that I want to discuss in this lecture, the contemporary idea of the self-made man. Before I go on, however, it's important to note that for both Luther and Calvin, desire was not really at play. For Luther, one had to have an external sense of call. There had to be a relationship involved. And for, for Calvin, desire was even more suspect. Desire was more likely a sign of disobedience and an, an, of an undisciplined and impulsive will. It was not until after the Enlightenment, with its emphasis on free will and the validity of the self, that we begin to get the foundations for the modern idea of the self-made man. Jeffrey Scholes, who teaches at the University of Colorado, has written a fantastic book about this very subject. And I invite you to read the optional reading this week, where you can get a taste of what he's doing there. You'll get a richer history than I've given here 
of the, the theological development of vocation, really from Luther all the way on uh, through modern life. But for our purposes, it'll be enough to say that in modern life, our conceptions of work uh, are quite different than Luther and Calvin. To discern whether one's work is properly vocational, we are thrust in modern life somewhere between God and the self. And in modern life, the question is typically more wrapped up in the, in the self than in God. As Scholl writes, God may call us to a vocation, yet how does one know that he or she is answering that call faithfully? Can unfulfilling jobs, as measured by the worker, be divinely sanctioned? Or how much influence can a society have on a career choice before that choice is at odds with God's plan? Can an individual's desire for a certain career merge with God's plan so that both are in sync, or, or will there always be a tension? These questions bring a level of critical reflection to the foreground of our thinking, usually left unattended. More often, we simply assume that the self-made man is just that, the one who achieves success based on his or her own abilities, character, and determination, and not external necessity or luck. But in this self-made man, what role is there for God, for a relationship with God, not to mention for an ultimate concern like Luther had in mind? the love of one's neighbor. That this is typically how we approach matters of work and labor today offers a real challenge for contemporary spirituality and discipleship. When work and labor are oriented towards the self, towards self-preservation, self-fulfillment, and the like, where is God? Where is my neighbor that I am to love? And what about that demand that we subdue the earth, that we care and tend to the ongoing act of creation that God has called good? Well, I'm going to stop there and leave you with these questions this week in hopes that you might bring them into our online conversations and into our reflections on practice. Okay, see you in the forums.